Hello and welcome. Today let's go over the respiratory system. Now when we talk about the respiratory system, this is a pretty fascinating system as well. Now let me jump a couple slides forward and here we can see when we talk about the respiratory system, these are the major organs that make up the respiratory system that we see here in this picture. Now here out of all of these organs, now the only actually externally visible component of the system is going to be this nose, the external nose. The rest of the system you can see is all hidden. So coming back now, when we talk about the respiratory system, the respiratory system you'll see is going to have a primary function. The primary function of the respiratory system is going to be to allow oxygen from the air to enter our blood and allow carbon dioxide from our blood to exit into the air. So again, that's the primary function of the respiratory system, to allow oxygen into the blood, right, from the air, and allow carbon dioxide out into the air from the blood. Next then we have the term ventilation. Ventilation is another term for breathing. Ventilation is going to include two parts. We will have inspiration and expiration, or we can say inhaling and exhaling. So inspiration and expiration, or inhaling and exhaling. Now these processes, inspiration, first we can see conducts air towards the lungs, and then expiration or exhaling is going to conduct air away from the lungs. The respiratory system works with the cardiovascular system to accomplish some homeostatic functions like we'll see number one, which is external respiration. When we talk external respiration, we're talking about the exchange of gases between the air and the blood. And number two, we'll talk transport. Transport is the movement of gases to and from the lungs and our tissue. And then number three, we have internal respiration, which is the exchange of gases between the blood and the tissue fluids. So if we were to go through and draw all that out, here we can draw that out here as something similar to this, where we can say now, here we've got the bloodstream. Okay, so here's the blood vessels. And then we can draw out a cell, which represents basically the tissue and the organ and basically that level there. So we said step one, we have external respiration, right? External respiration. And here we're talking about the exchange of gases. We said between the exchange of gases between the air and the blood. So gas is going to move in, make its way down, make its way down, and here is going to be exchanged with the blood. Now here oxygen making its way in, carbon dioxide making its way out is what we see here in external respiration. So oxygen making its way in, you can see there, and then CO2 we'll see is going to be then coming out. So that's external respiration. Now, we've got oxygen inside now. So then step two we said was transport, right? Then transport of gases, movement of oxygen then to the organs and the tissues then, right, making its way, uh, okay, making its way down. And then here, so we can put number two right in here, the transport, right? And then number three is going to be the exchange, internal respiration, oxygen actually moving into the cell, right? So here's where we have step three. And we said that was internal respiration. The exchange, we said there, between the blood and the tissue fluid. <clears throat> so here you can see is where then step three takes place. So step one is the movement and basically the exchange of oxygen between the air and then our blood. 
and then number two was transport, and number three was internal respiration. So when we talk respiratory tract, we can see the respiratory tract is going to start with the nose and it will end at the lungs. So if we look at in the lungs then in greater detail, here we can see inside the lungs now, first we've got our bronchi and the bronchi is going to make its way all the way into the lungs and it gets divided into smaller branches which are going to eventually end at, you can see the level of the alveoli. So these are the alveoli and you've got these blood vessels here on the outside and that's where then external respiration takes place. So exchange of gases between the air and the blood. Next then let's move through, let's uh, see this respiratory tract in greater detail. So again it starts with the nose and it ends at the lungs. Now as air moves through in the airways, air is going to be cleaned Air gets warmed and it gets moistened. So here you can see it's going to get cleaned by the nostril hairs and the cilia and the mucus that's going to be found along the nasal cavities and the trachea. And when we talk warmed, you can see it's going to get warmed by the heat that's given off by the blood vessels that are lying close to the surface of the airway lining, especially inside the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity we'll see is going to be very vascular. That's why you see a lot of bloody noses. And then third we can see here this air is going to be moistened by the wet surfaces of the air passages. Now as air moves out it cools and loses moisture. So here we can appreciate the path of air and the pathway that air takes to make its way to the and the alveoli is going to get divided up into an upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. So here you can see the upper respiratory tract is going to be made up of first the nasal cavity. So air is going to make its way into the nasal cavities. From the nasal cavities it's going to be passed on into the pharynx. From the pharynx it passes through the glottis making its way to the larynx and then down into the trachea, the bronchi, then the bronchioles, then into the lungs and into the alveoli. So let's appreciate all these structures. Let's start with the nose first. The nose is the only external portion of the respiratory system. It's part of the upper respiratory tract, which is also going to include the nasal cavities, the pharynx, and the larynx. Now air is going to enter through the nostrils, which are the external openings. And then we can see the nose contains two nasal cavities. It contains two nasal cavities. So air enters through the external openings, the nostrils, and then the nasal cavities are separated from one another by the nasal septum. They're going to be separated from one another by the nasal septum, which is composed of bone and cartilage. Mucous membranes are going to line the nasal cavities. Odor receptors are on the cilia of cells that are located high up in the nasal cavity. So it contains odor receptors. And it warms and it moistens air during inhalation. We'll see the tear, the lacrimal glands. They drain into the nasal cavities by the ducts, by the tear ducts. The nasal cavities are going to be separated from the mouth by a partition that's called the palate, which is divided into two parts, the hard palate and the soft palate. The hard palate, we'll see, contains only bone, and the soft palate is going to be made up of muscle tissue and mucous membranes. Next, then, let's move over to the pharynx. The pharynx is going to be a funnel-shaped passageway and it's going to connect the nasal and the oral cavities to the larynx. The pharynx is divided into three parts. We have the nasal pharynx. The nasal pharynx we'll see first is going to be where the nasal cavities open posterior to the soft palate. Second, then we have the oral pharynx. The oral pharynx is going to be found now where the mouth opens into the pharynx. 
And then third, we have the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is going to be found where the pharynx opens into the larynx. Next time when we talk soft palate, I'd like you to know the soft palate is going to have a soft extension that's called the uvula. The uvula is going to be found projecting into the oral pharynx. It's found as a pendulous structure you can see at the back of the throat. At the pharynx is where we're going to see air and food cross paths. The larynx is found lying in front of, or we can say anterior to the esophagus, which is going to receive food and direct it to the stomach. The larynx is going to lead to the trachea. We'll see the larynx and the trachea are normally open. We refer to them as being patent. They are open and they're going to allow for air to pass. The esophagus is normally closed. The esophagus is normally closed and it opens only when a person swallows. And then last here we have our tonsils. Our tonsils are going to be a protective ring. They're basically a protective ring of lymphatic tissue. They're a protective ring of lymphatic tissue that's going to protect us against inhaled microbes. I like to think of them as the bouncers or the security in uh, that's going to be found at the entrance of something, and this is going to be at the entrance of the pharynx. So in the oral cavity again, and the nasal cavity, we'll be able to appreciate different types of tonsils. So here then, let's move forward and let's check all this out. Here we can appreciate then the nasal cavity. So here we've got the entrance, the nostrils, the openings that are going to allow air in. And then here we'll see we've got the uh, smell receptors that are going to be found located high up inside of the nasal cavity, we said. So as air enters, air is going to pass and make its way into the pharynx. So here at the entrance of the nasal pharynx, we can appreciate our tonsils. And the same thing we've got at the oral cavities end, right before the oral pharynx. We've got more tonsils right inside of here. And then down here, we've got the laryngopharynx before we move into the larynx and the trachea. So the larynx, we said, is going to be found lying anterior to the esophagus, which is right back in here. Food and liquids are going to make their way down into the esophagus. And then here we've got air making its way down into the larynx and the trachea. But if we happen to have a food or liquids make their way down into here, then that initiates the cough reflex, which is going to be a powerful exhalation trying to remove whatever we have there. And then we'll say that, uh, you know, that food item or the drink or, you know, whatever we had there at the time went down the wrong tube. And, right, that's basically what's happening. It's going down this tube versus we wanting it to go down this tube. All right, next, then let's talk about our larynx then in greater detail. Now, when we talk about our larynx, our larynx is going to be a cartilaginous structure, and it's going to serve as a passageway for air between the pharynx and the trachea. So it serves as an air passageway for air between the pharynx and the trachea. The larynx is also called the voice box because you can see here, it contains our vocal cords. It contains our vocal cords. Also, we'll see the larynx is going to be called our Adam's apple. It's also called our Adam's apple, which is going to be found at the front of the neck, which we see here. All right, next, and I'd like you to know the vocal cords are mucosal folds that are going to contain elastic ligaments for support. And they have, you can see here, a slit-like opening between them that's called the glottis. The slit-like opening is called the glottis. Same thing you can see right inside of here. When air is expelled, it causes the vocal cords to vibrate, producing sound. When food is swallowed, the larynx is going to move upwards. So you can see here, the larynx we see right in here is going to move upwards against this epiglottis. This epiglottis is a flap of tissue. It's a flap of cartilage. It's a flap of cartilage that's going to prevent food from passing into the larynx. 
right? Because we want food to make its way down into the esophagus. So the larynx is going to rise when we swallow, pushing up against this epiglottis, closing off the pathway into the larynx, making sure that food has only one way to go, and that's going to be into the esophagus. And at the same time, we'll see this soft palate and the uvula are going to push up and close off the entrance up into the nasopharynx, again ensuring that food has only one way to go, and that's into the esophagus, eventually into the stomach. And we'll look at that pathway when we get down there. So we're here to talk about respiratory. So we're going to make our way from air making its way into the pharynx and then down into the larynx and the trachea. That's where we are at, down into the trachea. So let's talk then trachea next. The trachea, also called the windpipe, is going to be a tube connecting the larynx to the primary bronchi. The trachea is found lying in front of or anterior to the esophagus, and it's going to be held open by C-shaped cartilaginous rings. It will be held open by C-shaped cartilaginous rings. The open part of the C-shaped cartilaginous rings is going to face the esophagus. It's going to face the esophagus so that way this allows the esophagus to expand when swallowing. The mucosa that lines the trachea has a layer of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And here we can see when we talk about the function of the cilia, it sweeps mucus towards the pharynx. So smokers will lose the ability to be able to sweep towards the pharynx. Next then, let's move down to the bronchial tree. So here when we talk bronchial tree now, we can see we're going to be basically getting into then this pattern we see that's basically right inside the lungs. Now when we talk about the bronchial tree, first we'll see the trachea is going to divide into the right and the left primary bronchi. These primary bronchi are going to lead us into the right and left lungs. They lead into the right and left lungs. The bronchi branch into a great number of secondary bronchi that are going to lead us to our bronchioles eventually. Each of the bronchioles leads to air pockets or we can say air sacs that are going to be called alveoli. alveoli. So here let's look at that pathway. That's basically what we're seeing here in this picture if we move back one. So here you can see the bronchi will eventually lead us to the bronchioles and the bronchioles then you can see take us into the alveoli. So here's all those alveoli. A whole bunch of alveoli. Another cluster. You can see another cluster right up in here. So this is again where gas exchange is going to take place. And you can see here there's a pulmonary artery coming through and then gas exchange occurs and then the oxygenated blood is going to leave via the pulmonary venule. If you recall, pulmonary venule is going to take blood to the left atrium. Very good, the left atrium. And this blood here is coming from the right atrium, then the right ventricle, then the pulmonary trunk, then the right and left pulmonary arteries, and then the uh, arterioles, eventually the capillaries, and then you can see that whole pathway here. So next then let's talk about our lungs then. So let's talk about our lungs. Now when we talk about our lungs, the lungs are going to be found as a pair. We have two of them, the right and the left. We'll see they're going to be described as cone-shaped organs. They are cone-shaped organs that are going to occupy the thoracic cavity. They're found seated on top of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle that's going to separate the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity. It separates the two cavities from one another. Now when we talk about the right lung, the right lung is going to have three lobes or three divisions to it. And the left is going to have two lobes or two divisions to it, allowing room for the heart, we can see. It's going to allow room for the heart. Now the apex of the lungs is going to be narrow 
while the base is going to be broad and it curves to fit the dome-shaped diaphragm that it'll be resting on top of. Each lobe is subdivided, we can see, into lobules, and each lobule is going to have bronchioles that serve many alveoli, that will serve many alveoli. Next one, let's see here, each lung, I'd like you to know, is going to be covered by a serous membrane. It's covered by a very thin serous membrane that's called pleura, that's called pleura. Another pleura is going to cover the chest wall and the diaphragm. Another pleura covers the internal chest wall and the diaphragm. Both pleura produce lubricating serous fluid that's going to help the pleura slide freely against each other during inspiration and expiration. And we can see here surface tension is going to hold the two pleura layers together when the lungs recoil in expiration. We can see with each breath, air is going to pass to the alveoli. The alveoli are going to be made up of simple squamous epithelium that's going to be surrounded by blood capillaries as we saw earlier. Gas exchange is going to occur between the air in the alveolus and the blood that's found in the capillaries. Oxygen is going to diffuse into the bloodstream while carbon dioxide we'll see is going to diffuse from the bloodstream and into the alveoli, so it can be expelled out into the air. In order for gas exchange to occur, the alveoli, they must remain open in order to receive inhaled air. To help keep them open, surfactant is going to be found lining the alveoli. Pulmonary surfactant is going to help keep the alveoli from closing. We can see we have infant respiratory distress syndrome that happens in premature infants. Here we can see in premature infants, they lack surfactant. Without the surfactant, we can see this won't allow the alveoli to remain open, which then won't allow gas exchange to occur. So here we can see that as the air makes its way through, we have to make sure these alveoli remain open. If they're not open, then we are going to see gas exchange is not going to be able to occur. So surfactant is one factor that helps to keep those alveoli open. So we can see the capillary network of one alveolus in greater detail. Let's talk next then the mechanisms of breathing. Let's talk the mechanisms of breathing. Now, during ventilation, during breathing, a free flow of air is important. Medical professionals use a device called a spirometer to record the volume of air exchanged during both normal and deep breathing. Examining the breathing patterns is going to be helpful in monitoring lung health and also disease progression. So here then we can appreciate an actual spirometer. Here we can see this young lady is going to be exhaling into the tube, which is going to be then monitored by this computer here. We said spirometer is going to record the volume of air exchange during both normal and deep breathing. The spirogram we see here on the computer, it shows the measurements recorded when a person breathes as directed by a technician. A lot of patients who have asthma will probably have had this done, so some of you guys will be familiar with that. You've probably seen it or actually have, it, have had it done to yourself. So that's what we see right inside of here, a spirometer. Next, now let's move to our actual respiratory volume. So here you can see these are the various volumes that get recorded there, and then this is what are studied to understand how the patient's lungs are functioning. So when we go through each of these different volumes, we'll talk about what each of them stand for and basically the quantities of each of these volumes and how they'll come together and make up then different capacities that we'll mention there as well. So next then let's talk respiratory volumes. 
So when we talk respiratory volumes, first we have tidal volume. Tidal volume we can see is going to be the amount of air that can be inhaled and exhaled at rest. And when we talk tidal volume, it's about 500 milliliters, about 0.5 liters. You can increase the amount of air inhaled and exhaled by deep breathing. Now the maximum volume of air, the maximum volume of air that can be moved into and out during a single breath is called vital capacity. Vital capacity can be affected by illness. Next thing we can see, when taking a very deep breath, a healthy person can increase the volume of inhaled air beyond tidal volume by about 3 liters. And this is the inspiratory reserve volume. This is the inspiratory reserve volume. Next then we have the expiratory reserve volume. The expiratory reserve volume is about one and a half liters, and it's the amount of air one can forcefully exhale beyond tidal volume. Next then are our capacities. When we talk about our capacities, we have first vital capacity. Vital capacity is going to be the sum of the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. Respiratory volumes depend on various factors such as age. They start decreasing by about age 30. Gender plays a big role here. And also physical activity and physical activity. During normal breathing, only about 70% of the tidal volume actually reaches the alveoli. We'll see 30% 30% is going to remain in the airways. Residual volume I'd like you to know about as well. Residual volume is the amount of air that remains in the lungs even after a very deep exhalation. So you can say you can take out as much air as you want. You can exhale out as much air as you want. You're still not going to be able to remove all the air out of the lungs. There's still going to be a volume that's called the residual volume, which is still going to remain in the lungs. And that's typically about 1,000 milliliters, one liter. In some lung diseases, we'll see residual volume increases. It'll increase because the patient will have difficulty emptying out the lungs. So let's go over these various volumes right inside of this picture here again. So here you can appreciate tidal volume. This is normal breathing, normal inspiration and expiration, inhalation or exhalation, whatever you want to call it. And this is during rest. So we get about 500 milliliters of air in and about 500 milliliters of air out. 500 milliliters of air in, 500 milliliters of air out. 500 in, 500 out. Here we can appreciate then a maximum inspiration, a deep inspiration, and then a maximum expiration, a deep expiration, exhalation and then taking us back to tidal volume. So here we've got inspiratory reserve volume, we said is about three liters. Next we have tidal volume, we said is about 500 ml, 0.5 liters. And then expiratory reserve volume, we said about one and a half liters. And then our residual volume, another one liter we said, about 1,000 milliliters. So then here we've got our capacities, inspiratory capacity, tidal volume, and inspiratory reserve volume. Functional residual capacity is going to be ERV plus RV. And then vital capacity is IRV, inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume. And then total lung capacity is the total lung capacity. Next, then let's move down to inspiration and expiration. Let's talk uh, breathing then in greater detail. Now, when we talk inspiration and expiration, when going through ventilation, remember the following facts. Number one, normally there is going to be a continuous column of air from the pharynx to the alveoli. Number two, number two, the lungs are found within a sealed thoracic cavity. The rib cage is going to form the top and the sides. The intercostal muscles are going to be found lying in between the ribs. And then the diaphragm is going to form the floor. 
And then number three, we can see here the lungs, they're going to adhere to the thoracic wall by way of pleura, by way of pleura. So let's talk inspiration. Now inspiration, I want you to know, is the active phase of ventilation. It is the active phase of ventilation. This is when the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles contract. And the external, it says here internal, that's wrong. It's supposed to say external intercostal muscles. In the relaxed state, the diaphragm is dome-shaped. In the relaxed state, you can see the diaphragm is dome-shaped. In inspiration, we'll see then it'll contract. During deep inspiration, it contracts and it lowers. The external intercostal muscles contract and the rib cage moves upward and outward, allowing the volume of the thoracic cavity to increase, then allowing air pressure inside the alveoli to lower, allowing air to rush in due to negative pressure. So after this contraction, the volume of air in the thoracic cavity is larger and the lungs are expanded. So here we can see all of that taking place. Next then let's talk expiration. Expiration is going to be the passive phase of ventilation and we'll see no effort is required. In expiration, the elastic properties of the lungs causes them to recoil. During expiration, the abdominal organs will press up against the diaphragm and the rib cage moves down and inwards. So here we can see the diaphragm and the external intercostals will relax. Recoiling returns them to the original shape. And then we'll see the volume of the thoracic cavity decreases. And then air pressure inside the alveoli is going to increase, causing air to rush out. Expiration can become an active process when breathing is deeper and or more rapid. So here we can appreciate expiration. Expiration. Next then, let's check out the controls of breathing. Now when we talk about the control of breathing, resting adults are going to have a breathing rate of about 12 to 20 breaths per minute. This rhythm is controlled by our respiratory center that's going to be found located in the medulla oblongata of the brain. If you recall, we talked about that when we went over the medulla oblongata in the nervous system. This center, we can see it stimulates inspiration by sending signals to certain muscles. And then when the center temporarily stops, signals are not sent to the muscles. So let's look at that in greater detail. We can see the respiratory center is going to stimulate inspiration by automatically sending impulses to the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles during contraction via the phrenic nerve via the phrenic nerve. When then no signal is sent to the diaphragm and the external intercostals, expiration will occur, relaxation occurs. The respiratory center automatically controls the rate and the depth of breathing. Its activity can be modified though. It can be modified by nervous input and by chemical input. And we'll see here the vagus nerve is going to serve as the sensory nerve, as the sensory nerve, cranial nerve number 10. Let's look at the control of breathing thanks to the chemical input to our respiratory center. The chemical center is directly and indirectly responsive to, we'll see, certain chemicals. So first we can see it's directly sensitive to the levels of carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. When levels rise, the respiratory center is going to increase the rate and the depth of breathing. Now we talk indirectly, it's indirectly responsive to oxygen. Here we'll see chemoreceptors that are found in the carotid and the aortic bodies. They're sensitive to oxygen levels in the blood. Now when the levels decrease, impulses are going to be sent to the respiratory center. The respiratory center then increases the rate and the depth of breathing.
So here we can appreciate how our phrenic nerve and our intercostal nerves are going to innervate the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. And then we've got our sensory pathway thanks to our vagus nerve, all working with our respiratory center. Next, then let's move down. Let's talk about gas exchange. Now, when we talk about gas exchange, respiration includes the exchange of gases in the lungs. We call that external respiration and the exchange of gases in our tissues, which we refer to as internal respiration. Now, most of the oxygen that's going to be carried in our blood is going to be attached to our iron containing heme portion of the protein hemoglobin which we saw was found in our red blood cells. In relation to gas exchange, then let's check out external respiration and internal respiration then in greater detail. So first, when we talk external respiration, external respiration, it refers to the exchange of gases between air in the alveoli and blood in the pulmonary capillaries. Gases exert pressure, and the amount of pressure a gas exerts is called its partial pressure. And partial pressure, you can see, is going to be symbolized as PCO2 and PO2. Blood in the pulmonary capillaries has a higher PCO2 than atmospheric air does. This causes carbon dioxide to diffuse out of the plasma into the lungs. Most of the CO2 is carried in the plasma as bicarbonate. It's carried as bicarbonate. So here we can appreciate that. Most CO2 is carried as bicarbonate ions. So here you've got your bicarbonate ions. And then here it gets converted to carbonic acid, and then carbonic acid gets acted on by carbonic anhydrase, which will break down the carbonic acid to water and liberating carbon dioxide. I would like you to also know what would happen to a patient if they were to hyperventilate, if they were to start to breathe at a high rate. Now, if a patient was to hyperventilate, they would remove more carbon dioxide, and this will result in respiratory alkalosis. And they will have a high blood pH. Now, opposite to that, if you hypoventilate, if you hypoventilate, or let's say if you hold your breath, Respiratory acidosis can result. Respiratory acidosis results. We'll see the pressure pattern for oxygen during external respiration is the reverse of that of CO2. Blood returning from our systemic capillaries has a lower PO2 than alveolar air does. Therefore, in the lungs, oxygen is going to diffuse into the plasma and then into our red blood cells. Hemoglobin takes up this oxygen and it becomes oxyhemoglobin. And it becomes oxyhemoglobin, or HbO2 as we see down here. HbO2. Now let's look at internal respiration. In internal respiration, we'll see this process, it refers to the exchange of gases between blood and the systemic capillaries and the tissue fluid. Internal respiration services tissue cells, and without it, cells could not continue to produce ATP that's going to allow them to exist. Oxyhemoglobin gives up its oxygen, which is going to diffuse out of the blood and into the tissues because the PO2 in our tissue fluid is going to be lower than that of our blood. So this will cause our oxygen to jump from the blood into our tissues. And you see that right down here as well. The separation of oxygen from hemoglobin. So here we can see that oxyhemoglobin giving up its oxygen, which is going to diffuse out of the blood 
into the tissues, again, because PO2 in our tissue fluid is going to be lower than that of our blood. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the blood from our tissues because PCO2 of tissue fluid is higher than that of our blood. We'll see after CO2 diffuses into the blood, about 10% of it is going to enter the red blood cells and it gets taken up by hemoglobin forming carboaminohemoglobin forming carboaminohemoglobin. The rest is going to enter the plasma and it's going to form bicarbonate ions as we saw before. Carbon monoxide, I'd like you to know, is going to be a gas that has a higher affinity. It has a higher, you can say, attraction for hemoglobin than what oxygen does. So it's going to make hemoglobin unavailable for oxygen and therefore cellular respiration is not going to be able to occur when carbon monoxide is in the picture. That's why carbon monoxide is a very poisonous gas. So let's check out that internal and external respiration. So here we can appreciate external respiration first. Here we can see we've got carbon dioxide making its way from the red blood cells, our blood you can say, out into the alveolus so that way it can be expelled out into the air. While oxygen is making its way from the air and the alveolus into our blood. And then when we talk internal respiration, we're looking at the level of our tissues. So here you can see carbon dioxide is going to make its way from the systemic capillaries into the blood so that way it could be delivered into the alveoli. While oxygen, which was coming from the alveoli, is going to now make its way into the tissues. Let's move on to then disorders of the respiratory system. Let's check out some disorders here. The respiratory tract is constantly exposed to the air in our environment and thus susceptible to various infectious agents, pollution, and in some individuals, tobacco smoke. So the first disorder I'd like to talk to you about is going to be asthma. Asthma is a disease of the bronchi and the bronchioles in which the patient has wheezing, breathlessness, and sometimes a cough and expectoration of mucus. If the airways become irritated by allergens, the smooth muscle that's surrounding the bronchioles, it can also undergo spasms, closing off the pathway that air is going to be able to use to enter and exit the lung. Most asthma patients we'll see are going to have some degree of bronchial inflammation that's going to eventually lead to the reduction of the diameter of the airway. Medications are used in these patients and they're going to help dilate the bronchioles and control inflammation. So you can see it's triggered by a specific irritant and it can cause the smooth muscles to spasm. Again, it's incurable, but it can be treated with medication. Next, then let's talk about emphysema. Emphysema is going to be a chronic and incurable disorder in which the alveoli are distended and their walls are damaged, and this leads to the surface area for gas exchange to be reduced. So this leads to a reduction in the surface area for gas exchange. We'll see air gets trapped in the lungs, and this is going to lead to alveolar damage as well. And we'll see, because the surface area for gas exchange is reduced, less oxygen is going to be able to reach the heart and the lungs. These diseases are collectively called chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, or COPDs. COPD, I'd like you to know, is going to be the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, and it's usually associated with smoking, and it's associated with smoking. So here we can appreciate a few of these pathologies. 
First, we've got acute bronchitis, where the airways are inflamed due to infection or due to an irritant. And this is going to allow, and this causes coughing, which is going to bring up mucus and pus. And the second we can appreciate here, asthma. And then pneumonia. Pneumonia here, where you can see alveoli are going to fill with pus and fluid. And that's going to allow gas exchange to be much more difficult. And then TB, pulmonary tuberculosis. You can see tubercles encapsulate bacteria, and then the elasticity of the lungs is going to be reduced. And then emphysema, we mentioned. Here you can see the enlarged air spaces. And then last here, we can appreciate pulmonary fibrosis. Here you can appreciate some asbestos bodies. And here what happens is fibrous connective tissue builds up in the lungs and that reduces the lungs elasticity. So not good, not good, any of these pathologies. All right.